when live. Okay, welcome uh, members, welcome to today's assets and infrastructure uh, meeting for, for June. Um, welcome to our team from Shared Services, welcome to the table and um, we'll uh, get you introduced as you uh, come through later in the uh, later in the program. Could anyone be upstanding for the council? Um, Morina E hoa ngā mano tēnei ngā memo te kainihiro o rangi tikei. Te waka hoki o tēnei i te reo waka muimati mō ngā manākitanga i whiwhi nei mātou i roto i ngā mahi pai o tēnei rohe. Manākitia hoki mātou i roto i ngā take kei runga. I tō mātou tepu i roto o mātou nei hui. O te rā, e i hoa ngā mano, ko mai piki te ora, piki te kaha, piki te marumatanga me te rangi mārie. Kia mātou ngā tangata, ngā iwi katoa, kei raro i o mātou aroaro, nō reira ko te tumanako, ka mahi tātahi mātou i raro i te kotahitanga, mō ngā iwi katoa, kei raro i a mātou. Āmeni. Thank you, Councillor Rakao. Uh, we have no apologies, uh, have been notified at this stage, nothing for lateness either. No public forum on today's agenda. Conflict of in interest members, we're all well aware, uh, please uh, raise your hand and bring it to the Chair's attention should you feel that you may have a contact and uh, conflict throughout the, uh, the agenda today. Confirmation order of business, it is as tabled in today's agenda. There is no uh, alterations to the order of business. Moving on to confirmation of the minutes from the previous Assets and Infrastructure Committee meeting held on Thursday the 14th of April. We'll go through by page, starting with page eight. Nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Any matters arising from those minutes? One from Councillor Dalgetty. I'm just interested if um, Okakahahi have come back with the um, their rates, their far rates. Uh, there is something in today's table documents, I believe, with regards to that. Uh, so looking for a confirmation of the minutes as being true and correct. I'll move, move from Councillor Belsham, seconded from Councillor Carter. Thank you. Moving on to item seven on today's agenda, follow-up actions from previous meetings uh, listed there, one through to, through to 10. Rather than going through them individually, does any member require further comment or information regarding the list of follow-up actions? And if so, please indicate uh, which, which number you're speaking to. Your Worship, comment from you. Um, thank you. Just in reference to item number eight, um, requesting that staff investigate what has been submitted to Wakatahi regarding the introduction of reduced speed limits within the district, just noting really that there is still a consultation process that will be running from Bulls through to Whanganui, um, which is yet still to happen. So it will be ongoing for quite some time. Thank you, Councillor Belton. Yeah, item three, I'm just wondering if we have any update any progress in regards to item three that barriers. Should we go back to the running team over here? Yep. Yep. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't. So page 14. Oh, mobility is the mobility scooters. I can, I can reply to that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. that's, Thank that's you. Scenario. Uh, acceptable. Uh, I've had a discussion with the writing team uh, with regards to your request. So what they're going to do is identify all the places where we have those barriers up. They'll do a quick uh, assessment to see if they're wide enough or if we need to do any work, and then that'll come back to us in a nice structured format to say this is what needs to be done. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Yes. Just, do you know when it's going to be done? Uh, it'll be done by the next uh, A&I uh, meeting. Okay. 
Thanks, yeah. Bill. Are you happy with that follow-up to your question? Yeah, uh, if there's a report that will come back to the next A and I meeting, so we, when are we talk, there's two months away. So, right. Yeah. yeah. That's fine. Are you happy with that, yeah. Councillor Duncan? I have a question around um, item nine. I'm just wondering um, how much I should know about this when the work is going to start on the 13th of June. Um, we're not going to be updated until the next asset and infrastructure meeting. And um, if there are queries within the community about how this is going, and um, I just wonder if the new orders should, should be brought up to speed with that a bit sooner than the next meeting, particularly. Um, item nine, I would imagine that it is the yeah, so what happens is uh, they install electronics on the network, uh, lots of them. They then have a look at all the data that comes back and then they produce their reports. So I think it'll probably take two months for that work to be completed and for us to make sense out of the data anyway. Um, if we have any information before the next one, I'll send you, I'll send you an email, but I reckon two months is probably realistic. This is an existing work. Yeah, it's on the whole network. The entire network. So what we want to figure out is uh, how does the water move on the network? Are there losses on the network? How, how they yeah. Councillor Duncan, does that, uh, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Yes, you it does. in the right direction? It clarifies it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, mm. Your Worship. These aren't intrusive meters, aren't they? Are they? They're scrap electronic meters strapped or attached to the outside of lines rather than valves and things, isn't it? Well, actually, what they do, funny enough, they, they tend to use valves, uh, valves that are under underground yeah. on the network because the valve has a handy uh, metal um, yeah. that they can attach them to and they sit and listen and what they do is they collect all this data and all that listening and then they download all of them to kind of understand yeah. how things are moving. Yeah. And we're on the same page here. Yeah, so no one knows. Yeah, it's electronic mm -hmm. rather than intrusive. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. So yeah. that would be some inf when when would you expect that information to come back to the, the physical work, uh, because we're doing all, all our towns, uh, I reckon probably four weeks for the physical work, and then the download and the, and the making sense of the data, probably another two or three weeks. So I think we could bring something back to the next. So again, possibly at the next assets and infrastructure yeah. meeting, we could have an, uh, well, we'd certainly get an update yes. as to where you're at on this, yes. on this line item. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm very enthusiastic about this work. I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to enrich our knowledge of what's going on in the network. See you, Peter. I don't mind waiting for councillors. Well, yeah, is it relevant to this? It, yes, yeah, it is. is um, I, I minor comment is uh, I'd be happy to, to take an undertaking based on councillor's um, question for us to provide some um, media, com not media, but comms on our website around this initiative so yeah. that people are aware of what we're doing. Yeah, yeah that would be that right. would be good. Um, is the committee happy with that as a recommendation? Are you happy with that, councillor Bills, before oh. I take your question? Yeah, oh, yeah. we can sort this. Yeah. Okay. Councillor Bills. It's a question on item 10 on the updates. We had a commitment there, date of the end of May 22, to remediate those issues, and I still see they are there. Now, I understand and appreciate the, the impact on, on the roading team that uh, is currently happening with weather events and what have you, but can we have a, an update on that, please, and just when that work is likely to take place to remediate those issues there? Where would that comment, uh, response to that question come from, Anna? I'd like to invite John to uh, reply to that if possible. Or Phil. This is Edward Street. Oh, sorry, no, this is Calico Line intersection. So the yeah. the issues with the gradient there not as not as um, important, I think, as the road markings there uh, and the confusion in road markings. Uh, the road markings have been painted out black and then shifted over again. But at night time, um, when it's raining, it looks like there's about 50 different lanes when you're driving up through there, and, and it needs some mm. urgent remedial work uh, done. And yeah, I, I, with that date uh, that was in the follow-up actions, I expected that even if the, if the road markings had been dealt with, that would have been a high on the priority list. Sorry, through the chair. Yeah. Um, <coughs> um, I'm sorry I'm not a dealing with that issue. Um, I could go and chase it up and try and get back to you back uh, for this meeting, or otherwise I'd have to give a date for next the next meeting. Okay. Yes, 
Hamish. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Well, Chair. <clears throat> um, thank you. Um, can, I, can I suggest um, cl clearly that there's some piece of work that needs to be done um, with some urgency? Mm -hmm. So we've been undertaking to um, to get that done, and then any sort of follow-up reporting um, can come through. I'm not sure what the process will be for updating outside of the medium cycle, but from a safety point of view, um, I think we can action that fairly quickly. Yeah, thank um, you. Uh, the road marking is the concern. Yeah. The gradient side of it was a comment about <clears throat> who gives the final inspection about the the way that work was done, and we've got a, a, a whole change of gradient that doesn't meet, you know, it's, it's like hitting a cutter bar when we go through that intersection. That was a comment, <coughs> whether that gets remediated or whether it's um, certainly um, pointed out to the contractor that this is below the standards that we would normally accept. But the road marking thing is the critical thing that needs to be done with them. So, yep, you are you are quite correct, uh, Councillor Belsham. And this this matter has 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 been before us in other areas in town where we've changed lanes and whether or not the old paint needs to be ground off or a, a better quality of paint is used to make sure that these lines aren't painted out. Because Councillor Belsham is quite correct, driving there particularly at night, you've got no idea where where the actual lanes are. So I think it would be good if a some sort of action could come back from. Uh, Mr. War and his team possibly through to Mr. Badani uh, to get an update. But I, I would agree with you that I do believe it is a safety <laughs> issue and it should be addressed uh, uh, with some urgency. So, would you be happy with that, Councillor? Yeah, yeah. Happy to see it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Councillor Carter. Just on the, Sorry. On um, when are you going to fix that? If you try and water blast it, you'll, <laughs> it'll make it worse because the marks are still there. You're going to have to seal the whole area and then repaint them. Yeah, um, uh, thank you, uh, John, and welcome to the table. We have had this issue before yeah. uh, when we did do some other markings uh, in, in the town a couple of years ago. The same issue arised and the matter was dealt with. I don't know how it was dealt with, yeah, yeah, um, but it was whether it was it was repainted with better paint or a darker colour, but I'm not sure how it was dealt with, but the matter was addressed uh, yeah. for exactly the same reasons at another section just yeah, down the road. Happened. You have to see it. Yeah. Not sure what was done, but if we get a report back to to us, would be uh, would be helpful. Mr. Mr. Carter, um, through you, Mr. Chair, to the roading team. Thank you for dealing or attending to um, item six, which is the beans past the uh, golf course. And the other one that I have is eleven. What is happening with the Ewood Street uh, resilient curbing? So, see you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Alan met the contractor there yesterday. I uh, don't know what the argument that was, but it's, I've told them to fix it. So, I shall follow up with Alan and see what the outcome of that meeting is. So, it's not only the resealing, it's the curbing as well? Yeah, oh, sorry, Mr. Chair. I've talked about this before to the team, and I told them to get onto it. And Phil tells me that Alan met the contractor yesterday, and I'll find out what transpired. Um, we just might need to speak up a bit because I think Councillor Ash is having trouble hearing us. So, yeah. Shall I say it again? Um, I think um, just with regards to that. John, and so you're, you're, you're confirming that you've met with the, the contractor on site? Alan has met the contractor on site yesterday. Yeah. Um, but both this and the previous item are, uh, are listed as 12th of August 2021. Yeah. And, and it was his project, uh, remedial works to be completed by end of May 22, and now we're in June and we've yeah. just met the contractor on site. Yes, so there's the... been two or three cyclones, so we've been a bit busy. Yeah. That seems to be sitting around for a long time to have just yeah. met the contractor yeah. on site to discuss it. Yeah, well, we're coming up the other end of that, so this is on the agenda, so this is, we better get onto that because they'll be asking questions. When would we uh, <coughs> expect to get some response back from the contractor no. to you, back to us? As to... After this meeting, I'll phone Alan up and ask him what happened. We appreciate it, and then we could then get something from you back to yeah. again via Arno or our team to, to respond to that. Is that the best way to do it? That's yeah. correct. Thank you. Uh, 
Cheer. Uh, sorry, see you. <laughs> you can cheer if you wish. Uh, no, no, uh, thank you. Um, I, I do note from what you've said um, that we've made a commitment in this document, which was, only, which was generated a week ago, uh, that the works will be complete by the end of May. Um, I think it's incumbent on me um, and my team to ensure that these updates are accurate. Um, so it would be reasonable for elected members to expect that it's completed by the end of May, irrespective of the busyness of the team, um, because this is what we've pledged in our document. Um, so I, I respect um, we've misled the elected members on this one, uh, and we'll seek to improve our communications on this one to make sure we put realistic dates in. Thank you. Your Worship, questions for you? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not sure that we have been misled because I'm just trying to find it. There was some a line in one of the reports to say that that Edward Street would be done at the contractor's expense. So obviously the meeting had occurred, but I can't quickly find it. Where I read it, maybe it's in full council. Uh, I also require, uh, recall a comment of uh, similar nature, which was questioned, I believe, by Councillor Carter at a previous meeting as to whose expense this would be for the remediation work. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's, there is a couple of questions bouncing around there as to where this is actually, where this is actually sitting, and where it, yeah, I certainly recall a similar comment. Yeah, so uh, I'm not sure that you have been at fault. Anyway, we'll find it when it find it. Thanks, Mr. Council. Councillor Carter, you've raised the question on that. Are you happy that that's where we're going? That we would be, we're seeking some further feedback and updates as to exactly where this project's at. And, and I guess who's paying would be would be good to can get some confirmation on that one as well. Thank you. Again, Hamish, you've got a, an undertaking for that to send me back to us. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Yep. Now, are there any other matters uh, arising to the current follow-ups that are before us? None. Could I have somebody move that the follow-up actions be received? Thank you, Councillor Carter. Second from Councillor Lambert. Thank you. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, moving on now to my chair's report. Uh, has been circulated. It is in the order papers. Um, nothing much really there to discuss at this stage as the matters that I refer to. Uh, later in today's agenda. So unless anyone has any particular questions regarding that, I'll defer any further discussion on that to later in the agenda with the uh, items that we have listed and with the um, our uh, roading team uh, present today. Being nothing, I move from the Chair that my report be accepted, seconded from Councillor Dalgetty. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Item number nine, <coughs> report for information. Arno, as our Chief Operating Officer in this space, you'll take us through that. Well, thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, today with the writing team, I'm not sure how you'd want to deal with this one. <coughs> uh, generally, we will just step through all the different portions and ask if, uh, if there are any questions. I'm not sure if... Okay. Or do you want to... Well, let's let's have a look at it. Um, have all the uh, committee has uh, had an opportunity to to read this document? It has been in our uh, agenda papers, and we've had it for a, a week or so now. Is there any particular questions that any committee member has regarding this particular uh, document and the information that is in it? Does anybody have any particular questions that they want to ask, Your Worship? Um. Page 18 under 2.1 emergency works and the financial assistance rate for emergency works claim is expected to be 63% for the first 1.1 <coughs> million, increasing to 83% for the other um, million item plus change. Um, first of all, I'm a little bit surprised that it's expected to be at 63% when our far, current FAR rate is higher than that. So I'm not sure why the figure of 63 per cent is being used. Yeah. Do you want me to answer that? Yes. Uh, well, if you could answer that from the roading team, that would be appreciated. Thank you. When I wrote the report, I went on to Waka Kotaki's site, and on there, got all the financial assistance rates, and they said 63. I phoned up Richard Ashman at Waka Kotaki just before this meeting, 
and it's actually 65. Uh, that next year, 64, immediately after 63. 63. So I'll just put on the information there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so if we so, don't. Richard Ashman had to go through several spreadsheets, and he's got, you know, his direct line, uh, and he couldn't find it for a while, but it is 65, 64, 63. So through you, Mr. Chair, if we could just note the uh, note, note the error in the yes. in the report and update that, that it should be 65 in the current financial year. Yes. And as the Walker Co. Tahi Emergency Works funding uh, arrangement is in place, they, they essentially have a and up to sort of 20% extra for the larger events. So we'd expect that for the first one or $1.1 million, which is approximately 10% of your base program, they'll fund the emergency works at the base fire rate. Mm -hmm. And then for events bigger than that, um, the fire rate increases by mm -hmm. a figure of approximately 20% for the balance. <coughs> Thank you for that. Now, Councillor uh, Dalgetty, did that answer your earlier question that you raised during the... Yes, the, the when we were looking at the previous one. Thank you. Yeah. Your wish actions required because this was a clarification that I saw at the previous meeting around yes. the, the far rates. Um, so that tidies that up as well. The, the next part of that question is have we received any further advice from Wakakotahi um, recently around the figures? John, just before the meeting when I was talking to Richard Ashman, they're still addressing the claim. He hopes to get it done this month so that the costs can come to bear. Um, Apologises for the delay, but it's very <laughs> good. Thank you. Through you, Richard. Uh, just to chair, if I could, um, we, we had a, a similar delay for the Manawatu rating claim as well, so it's uh, it's very much, I think, just the Waka Kotahi processing all the additional works. Um, it's not specific to RDC, um, and I've got no reason to believe that they won't approve that in full. They approve the NDC no. claim in full. This is true. Wanganui and Tarurua still haven't had their money. Yeah. Um, we, Mano 2 got their um, money came through this month. So um, I've been hounding Wakiko Tahi. Uh, literally. Literally. <laughs> um, it's, Hopefully today, but definitely this month, so that we can sort out the finances. Thank you. We do have a question online from Councillor Ash. Councillor Ash. Thank you, Chair. Um, sorry, it wasn't in regards to what we've just been discussing. It was an item further down the report. Is that okay now? Uh, just, just before we jump into that, uh, Councillor Duncan has her hand up as well. Sure. I'll just check and see if her question relates directly to the matter we're discussing at the moment, Councillor Duncan. It's just, um, a, just a matter of um, asking for clarification, because in that case, does that then meet the... Um, for the first um, $1,100,000 increasing, to, does that then go up to 85% as of the 20%? That's correct, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that question. And just before we go back to uh, Councillor Ash's question for another matter, what action do we need to put in place here to make sure that this is report is, is corrected with this number? Is it... Uh, is it uh, just get noted uh, that there is a, because um, the report's obviously uh, incorrect. We'll note it in, we'll note it in the minutes as a, as a, yes. as a correction. Yes. Right. Yes. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Councillor Ash, happy to take your question now. No worries. Now, um, this is in regards to the road to zero. Now, this isn't entirely um, an RDC issue, and it was something I um, wanted to raise before this meeting, so apologies that I, I didn't raise it prior, but I would love um, to see RDC actually um, work with Waka Katahi to lower the speed in the Mangaweka Township, um, which is getting progressively dangerous for people trying to cross the road or cars coming in or out. It's quite a busy little um, township now with a cafe there, um, all the, the gas stations and, and, and electric um, uh, stations. Um, and it's still a 70k area. Having said that, vehicles don't necessarily drop down to 70. They're quite often um, still going through there at, at 90 and 100. Um, but you've got the school across the road and the play centre uh, that, that families are trying to get across the road. And I've been approached by a number of um, locals there asking how we can go about uh, requesting that the, the 
the speed limit is reduced. Um, so just wanting to put that in there um, under the road to zero uh, possibly as an agenda item for, for next month, or, or maybe this is just a conversation that that um, our team can speak with Waka Katahi, but I think it's, uh, um, yeah, it would be definitely appreciated uh, by the locals in Mungaweka. Thank you, uh, Councillor Ash. Uh, Mr. Jones is, perhaps can give us some advice on how we may be able to advocate that or what the process might be. Well, John? with it being a state highway, it doesn't fall under that road to zero because that's for the district. But I can um, relay your concerns to Dan Tate at Waka Kotahi, the safety man, and um, tell him what the situation is and ask him if they've got any plans. Yeah, and I think we, we probably the key point there is we can certainly advocate, yeah. but it is not a Rangitiki District Council road, and therefore our ability to influence or change that is is limited by the Waka Kotahi agenda in terms of their um, speed yes. zone management um, through that area. So, okay, thank you, Councillor Ash. Further further question with regards to that, or yes, please. Is there anything that I can um, help with? Is there any information that you'd like from me that might help with the advert? advocating to Waka Katahi, um, yeah. Um, I think uh, through you, Mr. Chair, um, I think an initial discussion with the Waka Katahi representative, um, and if there is an appetite for them to consider it, they'll have a criteria for what that would include. And that's probably the point to maybe come to yourself as a local uh, representative to, to maybe find some of that information if it's not already held um, by council or, or through the voting team. Councillor Ash, you happy with that uh, response? Thank you. Mr. Bix. Um, I just, so, sorry, um, uh, I did receive a request from a ratepayer yesterday for our council to do the same, but for the intersection of State Highway 1 and Rose Road. Um, they believe that to be a dangerous intersection. So um, I would ask Mr. Jones to similarly bring that to the attention of Waka Kotahi. Rose, Row, Rose, Rose. Uh, R O W E S, Rose, Road. As I wish I could know. Uh, um, look, there's, a, there's a whole review that's being done by Waka Katahi on regional uh, regional speed limits. That is current process. Um, we'll be invited to submit to that. That does not overrule the opportunity for a TA to put in a specific request. And my advice to Councillor Ash is if she wants to progress that, um, it's a notice of motion for Council to put a request forward. Um, it's far better if it, if it comes as a, as a request from Council, but that will fold into the process that Wapa Katahi is currently going through. Yes, uh, you wish it. So would that be at a at the time of a general open consultation on roading with the uh, speed limits within the area, or are you suggesting that there should be a separate, uh, separate uh, as 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 Mr. War said, advocation from the um, from the council on a, a separate separately, or is in conjunction with the wider? Um, I'd advise Councillor Ash if she feels that way to put a notice of motion locally, but it will feed into the regional uh, speed review that's currently been planned. So it will be caught up by that. Perhaps you could have a conversation with uh, Councillor yeah. Ash um, privately with, uh, to see if we could um, see a way forward that may be of some assistance to Hamish and John and his team uh, uh, with regards to these two matters. It might be uh, the best way forward. Yeah, um, specific to Mangaweka, um, there is a drive to reduce all speed limits um, and there's dates around it, around any school. Yeah. So that would be automatically caught up with because Mangaweka is, in that, is within that township. So you're talking of a speed limit around that school potentially being lowered almost to 40 k's. Well, that's a separate conversation you can have with Councillor. Yeah, so there's a whole lot of processes currently going on. Councillor, Councillor Belsham, question from you. Yeah, page 20 of the order paper. And in regards with the reseals, uh, comment at the top of the page, 50 k's of reseals were programmed. The actual length sealed was 45 k, so it's left sufficient budget to resurface or surface Main Street Station Road and Matai Street intersection 
with hot mix. Now, when is that projected to take place? Will that happen in this financial year, or will that be a carry forward into the into the next financial year? Um, that'll be a carry forward into the next financial year. Okay. But we were looking at Hereford Street as a replacement. Well, that, that's showing some signs of early cracking and if we catch it now, that would be the, the least cost option. So that may come out of the programme, this one here? Mm -hmm. Flip-flop. Right. Swap. Okay. So time frames? Well, so if we're changing that around, what are, what are we talking time frames? Uh, still talking about this financial year. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Next two weeks? Yeah. Next two weeks? Yeah. Okay. It's a uh, two-day um, Your Worship, a question from you? Yeah, just before I ask the question, are we live streaming? Yes. Yeah. Um, in terms of road improvements, by my reckoning from page 21, we're placing a $3.3 million carry forward on operational costs of roading. So... If that is the case, according to those figures, there are a couple of things that arise out of that. One is where we have struggled on road maintenance, and I think we're going to say no, but is there an opportunity to engage with Waka Kotahi in terms of using that money to do further um, you know, meddling or road maintenance that we're struggling with, so transfer it from one category <coughs> to another? Bearing in mind that the residents have already been rated for this work. So CAPEX work, they're not rated until the following year, but operational, they are. So there's 3.3 uh, million of, of operational funding there. Thank you for that question. Uh, Mr Jones, you're on the floor again, I can see. Uh, do we have that degree of flexibility? No, we do it? not. Um, there's maintenance and renewals, and that's... <coughs> The money they've given us that's locked in for you know the budget's locked in for this year that's just finishing the next and the one after you cannot take money out of um capital which is the improvements they won't let us do that and that's where the surplus is because we, we just can't get people to do the work so that whole program needs to be rationalise to see what can be done with the resources that are available for professional services and contractors. And we're going to have to put contracts out to see how much of that we can do. And I'm picking that there'll be a surplus, which we will have to declare. And then the products that we don't do move on to the next, well, the next 10 year programme we have to reconfigure it. Can I through yeah. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Wall. Through, through the chair, I think just, just to confirm, and I think from, from what uh, Mr. Jones has said, the, the renewal and the maintenance components of the roading program um, are largely the components that have been being delivered. It's largely the capital components, which are the improvements in the over and above, which relate to a lot of those deferrals. And so it's it's not so much a matter of putting more metal on the road out of capital money. We've already done essentially what we said we would do in, in, in those maintenance um, budgets. And then it comes down to the Waka Kotahi process around the budget allocation for the various codes. And I guess the numbers don't quite align, but you've got, a, as you say, about a $3.3 million deferral um, combined with a $2.1, $2.6 million um, emergency works, which effectively has supplanted a lot of that resource uh, and capacity, which is which is a, a big contributing factor to a lot of the delays of getting things done. I think if you combine that with the existing concerns that we've already got around contractor availability, material availability and supply chain, it, it's really compounded an existing yeah. problem that no one really needs. So yeah. it is going to give us cause to, to re, reconsider some of that program going yeah. forward. Yeah, so going back to maintenance and renewals. Part of the renewals is the <coughs> rehabilitation, the rehabs, area-wide treatments. None of them have come to pass this year. So uh, we had a meeting with the contractor last week. So the stuff that they haven't done this year, that's what they've got for this year coming 1st of July. 
And then the program for 22-23, I've um, commissioned WSP to write a contract for the entire second year rehabs and put that out to contract, out to tender and get another resource in to catch up on the rehabs. So that is the, and then once we've caught up year one and two, then we'll be looking at year three to see how we can deliver that. We might have a fighting chance on year three, maybe. Yeah, well, we'll have a bit more run at it. But yes, it was very disappointing that the contractor was unable to deliver any of the rehabs for this year. And so this one question. Yeah, we this raises a, a number of issues. Um, for instance, uh, Hamish, you're telling me that it's capital works, and John, you're talking about maintenance and renewals, which must no. be operational, surely. No, I'm talking about two different things. The rehabs are in maintenance and renewals. That all these budgets are locked in; they won't let us change them. I'm just saying for. The under, expendi under expenditure in the renewals, which is the rehabilitation sites, not the improvements, that money will be carried forward. Higgins will do the ones that they didn't do this year. And then the ones that are for the second year are going out to tender so that we can get additional resources to catch up. The other part of it is the improvement program, which is um, low cost, low risk. And they're all separate projects mm -hmm. um, and they haven't moved as long either so i'm going to have to look at that program and rationalize it and that one will more than likely be under spent as well i, I guess the question here is as a writing one so if it is if it is capex works that are being deferred or carried forward does that get added to 3.3 .3 million to our budget later. I think this is probably a conversation we need clarification on maybe um, no, during the day or ahead of council. I'm not quite sure where you where you're going with that one, you worship. But if you if you want to defer this this question, because we have a I have a question from uh, Councillor um, Gordon over here, but it's, if you want to seek some clarification, that then I think you know I'll talk this through with staff. Okay. Yeah, possibly. So I got an understanding of this. Okay. Were well, you happy to leave that there, or you have further comment to that? Um, um, yes, and yes, if, if, if I may. Um, with the with the Waka Kotahi funding program, they work in a three year block, um, as we know. So from a from a deferral <coughs> and a carry forward point of view, um, from from Waka Kotahi's perspective, there's no problem as such carrying money from year one to year two or year two to year three. They have a hard end at the end of the three yearly cycle because that's their budget period closed off. So that there is a level of flexibility from year to year, not within the different work categories as, as Mr Jones has outlined. But it's essentially what we're trying to achieve is the local share lining up with the Waka Kotahi component to be able to deliver as much of this as we can. And this year has just been a very, very challenging year. So the overall work programme, we're still committed to try and do as much as we can, but I think we're realistic that some of those capital projects may not be able to be delivered, largely because there's just simply not the, the contracting resources out there to do it. So I, mean, I totally accept that. That's no problem to me at all in terms of the relationship with the funder. My question is around how it affects our budgets in terms of its capex work, should it be included to our capex schedule to be carried forward, which then alters our, our um, depreciation schedules and other things as per later and I think that question happens. can possibly be best taken up with yeah, our, with our finance team here and through the chief executive with yeah. uh, to to see if we can nut out what that what impact that um, that may have that yeah. you you believe it's what I, I think that's best to, best to do it that way and then we can come back to the committee or to subsequent see if I will, this is him, I'll okay I'll just take um uh, just before I go to Dave Toombs, uh, I'll just take a question from Councillor Gordon, who's right. had his hand up. Two separate questions, Chair. Mm -hmm. First is about the roading, the capacity of our roading contractor. I'd like to ask the staff, do they have confidence that the contractor is able to carry out the contract as it sits? Because it seems that there's an awful lot of stuff not being done. Through you, Mr Chair. Um, 
I, I guess that's a, a very relevant point, Councillor Gordon. Um, and as, as Mr Jones has outlined, we are looking at shifting a component of this year's rehab work into next year and effectively taking next year's programme and looking to tender that. Um, and I guess that is a reflection of the capacity of a, our existing road maintenance contract, but also the wider market. Um, so do we have confidence that they could deliver the whole lot? Short answer is no, they can't, which is why we're probably working on this. Um, to be fair to the contractor, they've also been involved in a ton of additional um, emergency works related um, projects um, on top of what was originally contracted and resourced for. So, so there's, it's, it's not quite as straightforward as can they do it or not. There's actually a number of uh, components into that. But the process that we're looking at in terms of tendering out some of that next year's programme is around being able to deliver on the level of service that we have with the community through the, through the roading activity um, without, I guess, breaking the contractor in an unrealistic way if they simply don't have that additional resource, which is effectively what it would be. So we're trying to work our way through that, and it's and it's not just on the regular decay side. So. John, is it? Did that's that right. It is. Um, apart from the additional workload with the cyclones, you know, like two million dollars worth is quite an impact. <coughs> but we've had COVID, and a lot of the workforce is, has been ill, so they they're down there. And then the other component of it is getting your hands on the materials. So we're doing the best we can with the, within the limited resources available. And as I said, we will catch up on the maintenance and renewals by contracting out. Um, and there will be surpluses in the capital programme. But we've got two years left of this contract to run. So it's, in my view, it is better to work with the industry which is scrapped at the moment, and get the best possible outcome by working collaboratively rather than whipping them every time there's a pothole. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. Um, my, my, my second question. If we look at emergency works, um, we have a number of what I'd call repeat offenders in here. Um, they're parts of our landscape that are challenged in inverted commas. And so it's a big pic picture question, and it's with a view to what's coming at us with climate change and more of these cyclones. At what stage do we stop doing what we've always done and expecting a different result? Because I think clearly we need to change how we operate in some key sites that are costing us an awful lot of money. And that's going to involve talking with other people apart from our internal. It's going to be horizons, it's going to be landowners. It may be that we need to start thinking about purchasing some bits of landscape so that we can so that, that whole bit of landscape can be managed differently. Because we're at the we're at the end of the queue, if you like, and we just take the financial whipping every time the wheels fall off. So where does that conversation sit? I can answer that one. So emergency works funding is just to replace like with like. If there are some areas that need work done to it to make it more resilient, then we have to program that in future programs for whatever it is. There's that one site that, what is it, the name of that street road? Mangahoy. Mangahoy. That's one in, um, that needs to be looked at, but the problem there is it's a drainage issue. Um, everybody is saying that's not my problem, so I've told our guys to go and clear the drain on and, chat, and so it doesn't happen again and chat it to the emergency works or we'll just sit there pointing fingers at each other and it will happen again and again and again so we have just got to fix it but, you know um, broadly speaking look we need to be look, start looking at resilience projects going forward so where there's areas that um, that have problems, then we have to put them in the program and seek resilience funding from Waka Kotai. But emergency works yeah. is pretty limited to put it back, put it back the way you found it. And if I, if I could say through, yes. Mr. Chair, I mean, we, we have through the roading program tried as best we can in terms of, in terms of things like roadside drainage maintenance over the last mm. um, 
several sort of um, annual cycles to, to try and do the best we can with the budgets available to, to increase the resilience of the existing roading network. So, so culvert clearing, um, obviously we don't get all of them all the time, and I know there's a few of those that are still bouncing around some of the resident concerns, but, but the water tables, the roadside drains and culverts are a key way of trying to maximise the resilience of the network by getting that water away, but it's still got to go somewhere and there's still going to be a downstream effect, and that is part of a much bigger integrated sort of look at, at the, the wider network. And if you go to Horizons, um, they have limited budgets and they have their priorities. Um, we have limited budgets in our priorities. Landowners um, typically will be looking at regional and district councils to, to fund a lot of this work. So essentially everyone wants a lot of things done and no one's got a lot of money to spend on it. So it is an ongoing problem that we have across the entire network. So. I think, um, uh, Hamish, thank you for those comments. I think we all accept, we all accept that, but I think one of the questions that, um, or one of the comments that Councillor uh, Gordon just said is, uh, and, and forgive me if I'm wrong here, Councillor Gordon, but are we talking to the right people? You know, are we just assuming that your team and your your contractors are going to the right spots? You know, there's some there's some good conversations that can be had with some local people in the areas that may actually lead us to those problem spots that are not being addressed. So, are we missing some local knowledge here? And how do we capture? that because we, as you just said, there's a few culverts that we've possibly missed somewhere along the line and we accept that everyone's busy and we've got limited budgets, but how do we, you know, how do we actually have better conversations to make sure that the resources and things are in the right spot? Because I think we do miss, um, we miss a trick uh, and we do ourselves an injustice by not actually asking those right questions of the right people. I think we can do better in that, in that space. But gets the uh, Gordon, Councillor Dalgetty, hello. Uh, look, uh, uh, I've sort of thrown to that there is the thinking piece, and I think it's a bigger conversation than just the roading team. Yeah. It's a landscape issue <laughs> in, in parts of our network, and it's, you know, it's got to involve more people than just, you know, the contractor or the roading team chasing a culvert. But I'll leave it there. I don't want to hog the floor, but I think, I think we need to think about it in a big picture sense. Okay, thank you. Councillor Delgetti. I'm just um, wanting to understand, we've got a comment here, block drains to be cleared in farmer's paddock. So where is that line of what's our responsibility and what is the farmer's responsibility? And further to that, what if some farmer goes ahead and, and does something that impacts our road? Um, and where does that responsibility lie? Or what happens in that situation? So, as I just mentioned with the, what's the name of the road? Mangahori. Mangahori. The farmer should clear their own drains out. But then the farmer will say, oh, it's not my responsibility, it should be horizons. And then Horizon say, no, it's not one of the drains that we maintain. And they can go round and round in circles. So in this instance, we're going to clean the drain rather than have the thing flood one more time. Because to repeat the same actions and expect a dif different result is the definition of madness. So we're just going to bite the bullet and do that. But um, uh, in other instances, it comes down to the Drainage Act, 1908. And then there's always arguments around who does what. And who pays for what. And who pays for what. Because nobody likes spending their own money. Chief Executive has has, has comment related to, to this question. Yeah, I think just to support what, what John has said, um, on this particular in, uh, example, I have spoken with the farmer. The farmer has spoken with Horizons, exactly as John said. Horizons said this is not a drain that is supported by Horizons. Um, I met with him, uh, the farmer, with our regional manager for Wakakotahi, and the regional manager for Wakakotahi expressed surprise that we hadn't gone to him to seek uh, funding from him to repair the damages to our road, uh, given it was a known blockage in his property. Um, so I think what John has suggested is an overly generous approach to addressing the problem, but nonetheless will address the problem. Just on that, we have been in contact with Waikakotahi about funding 
that problem and they're busy going through every um, item on that thing and they're trying to knock it back. So what one person will tell you is not necessarily what happens in reality. Yes, true. Hmm. I think what we just heard, heard within that uh, conversation was uh, a practical ex uh, action for a practical fix. And I think that's really what the committee is, is, is seeking in all these questions is, you know, let's get practical about some of these things. If we if we can send a bulldozer in or a digger in there to clear the drain, that might save us a million dollars down the down the road and possibly Waka Kotahi come back to us and go, well, hang on, why are we still funding this when the issue is here? Let's put the digger in there. Let's, let's, let's get it sorted. But I'm hoping somewhere along the line that we have the flexibility within this whole roading infrastructure and team to be able to act and to be able to actually think a little bit pragmatically about it and go, well, that's the problem. Let's not all dig our heels in the sand and say it's not my problem because it's costing. And it's costing us and it's costing road players a huge amount of money. Yeah, but we probably have more flexibility in an emergency works response than we do working it through an audit works um, agreed budget with Waka Kote. So, so we do take some practical steps in that. But you've got to wait till it rains for that to happen. So so if we can't, we can't shift that flexibility from just an emergency because just an emergency is after the fact. We're yeah. trying to get before the fact. Exactly right. Yeah. Your Worship. When you talk about local knowledge, um, we have some of the county engineer who built this road, I took him over this network. Um, he, on this section of road, he stopped me. And he said, you're going to have ongoing issues with this. He said, when we built this road, we could not find a bottom to it. So he said, this section of road is actually built, the substructure is a series of logs. Literally said, it's a swamp, and we just laid logs beside each other all the way across it. He said, they're not treated. He said they're all going to rot out. And he said they're he said fundamentally that section of road, um, that's the issue. And I would imagine it's not the only one yeah, across the district. It was interesting, that was the one section section mm. on a day that I spent with him that he said, You've got a problem. Okay, I think we've probably fleshed out about as much of that as what we're going to be able to achieve um, around here. Um, but apart from to, to perhaps sum up on that, if we can just be get some, be proactive uh, in, in, in how we're structuring and, and, and come back to us. Mr. So Toomes Mr. Toom had his hand I up. I see his hand is time. down now, but that has, uh, whether or not he's still got a question related to your question on the yeah. rates. Dave? Yeah, thank you. Um, hopefully my connectivity will... Um, hold in, but if I drop out, I'll turn the video off. Just in direct response to one of the Mayor's comments about depreciation, I just wanted to point out that um, the draft annual plan has next year's depreciation being 5% lower than what was in the long-term plan for year two. So many of these items that the Mayor was talking about have been recognised in the draft annual plan. So I just wanted to point that out that we are aware of that and adjusting budgets accordingly. The, the question to me, Mr Toomes, um, should that 3.3 be added to our carryover figure, or are you not concerned about it? Oh, no, certainly concerned. Uh, there, there is um, recognition in the carry forwards. Um, if, yeah, if the works will be carried forward from this year to next year, then yeah, yes, it will be carried forward, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Dave. Now, we've um, sort of bounced around a whole lot of things there which are sort of further in the, in the report, so we possibly have got a wee bit ahead of ourselves. Um, but we, if we could just get ourselves back onto, onto track after that quite robust discussion with regards to, uh, to roading. Was there any other particular matters in the, um, the report that we're looking at here that any particular council has highlighted or circled for, for discussion? It's going through uh, the list of... Um, uh, carry forwards and deferrals from there, and it's. Is there any other further items in particular, Council Delgetty? Uh, on page 25, road to zero, I'm just interested um, around this active signage and just want to think about the Hunterville School. Um, they, as a school, uh, put their own um, active signage up. So I just want, if this is, you know, like new technology, um, 
swifter and better them to be considered because we have an issue with a lot of logging trucks going past that school. Yeah. Is that in action, uh, Hamish or John, that we can have added into this process or do, do we not have, again, that flexibility to do that as a request for, for this point? Um, this Road to Zero programme is put together by Waka Kotaki and they said these are the ones that you will do. Um, so we can bring the, that one up in the next. Is that right, Alan? Um, yeah, John, I think Hannibal is is due in year three for a um, revisit of, of the oh, signage. Awesome. Okay. So it's in the, in the next one. So it is, yeah, it's in, yeah, the, it's in, the, it's in, in the, the block. Group. So these, yeah, they dictate to us which ones we yeah. do. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you. Okay. Does that answer your question? they've said you can have that one. <laughs> okay. Thank you for that response. Thank you, Ella. Other, other matters arising from this report? Councillor Belsham. At page 26, the unsubsidised construction, and there's comment there around the Cobber Cane Air from the Morrow Hall Playground car park. Um, Deferred to 22-23, there's a, in the comments though, there's a draft geometric design and it's complete. So does that mean the actual works will take place in the next financial year? So we are carrying out the repaving or sealing of that piece of road? The construction split over uh, over two years, years, years two and three, so yes, um, there should be some construction next year. So that was construction starting next year yeah. on, on that? Yeah. Okay. So this coming financial year, 22, 23, construction work will start taking place down there at Cobber County. Yes. But it has been a question that's been raised a number of times. So it's just to have some confirmation. Mm. The design has been done and the actual physical works would start next financial year. Right. Thank you. That answer your question, Councillor Pilsen. Okay. Further questions of this report, Councillor Dalgetty. Um, I've just got some questions around the Higgins Zero Harm report. Uh, page for that, please, Councillor. Um, page 27. Thank you. I'm uh, just interested that over um, 10 months there's been no near misses reported, and I struggle with the reality of that. Um, and I see there's, there's no lag, there has been no lag indicators ever. Um, and also I see there's one, a positive um, drug and alcohol test, and I'd be interested to know what happens in that situation. That would be a question possibly through Hamish or John, but whether or not that's, you it's, have that answer is it's directly from Higgins's report. It's, yeah, it's a Higgins report. So lag indicators are accidents. So it's really good if you don't have any. Um, the, Positive reinforcement if they've been drug and is it the drug and alcohol you got? Yeah, yeah, they're tests. The tests. And you oh, the one down a positive. So that will be Higgins's um, policy. They may um, give them a second chance and um, give them some assistance, or they might give them yeah. don't come Monday. So, but that will be Higgins's own process. And subsequent to that, there was a question also there from Councillor Dougherty with regards to the near miss close call being nothing reported to people from July to April, which is a little unusual. And I, I think probably, I'll fair enough, I think that's probably just a question for us back to Higgins. Yeah. Um, it does, you're quite right Councillor, it does look um, unusual and, and I would certainly expect to see more um, near miss reporting um, across the board. Um, as we do internally here, so um, okay. let, let us follow that one up directly with the Higgins contract management team. Okay, thank you. Councillor Dougherty, you're happy with that response from Hamish? Thank you. Councillor Duncan. Uh, just quickly, 2.6 on page 27. I've had a lot of feedback from the locals around the Bridge, being able to use it, the opening of it, um, and the Po and the Pafenua. 
and it's all been very positive and they're looking forward to it being um, completely completed, but they are very appreciative of, of it being open and being able to use it. Thank you, oh, Councillor Duncan. Thank, thank you for those thank comments. All the Irish and Zoom would appreciate having it open too. Yeah. It has been a, a you know, it's been a many, many years in the making that to, so the opening day here to see it finally come to fruition yeah. um, ahead of time was a was a great milestone for for, for this council, um, our neighbouring council MDC and, and I think for all parties involved. So yeah, it's been thank you. Thank you. Councillor Dalgetty. Um yes, thank you. Uh, great to see it open. Um I do agree with someone's sentiments on the day that if we were being asked to build this now, would we have actually got it? So I think that's, yeah, congratulations to your team on making it happen. Um, a comment that I am a little bit concerned about is if you think about the eastern side, if a car is coming onto the bridge on the eastern side, there's not a lot of visibility. If a truck is coming down the west, the western down the hill and the western side and they meet on the bridge, meet on the bridge, I think it would be tricky for either to back that. Uh, possibly. Um, least tricky for the car, I would imagine. But um, We're going back into, into yeah. uh, right. we've corner. got no visibility. Yeah. 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 Can I say something? Mm. So, Mr Jones. When the thing is completely finished, we've planted some shrubs and finished the guardrails and what have you, then the closing stage of the project is to get an independent safety audit to go through and see if there's anything that needs fettling. And the bridge is seven metres wide. It's built as a single lane. It's a very generous single lane bridge. So it's been designed so that two trucks can pass each other. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. We have a, uh, sorry, how much? Uh, just, just one. Thank you, John. Just one point on the Mangamooka Bridge. I would like to just to acknowledge with the committee. Um, Mr. Jones has um, essentially project managed that very closely with the contractor and external consultants from day one. Um, and a lot of the credit for the for the the administration and actually delivery of that project. Um, I know John's fairly um, reserved in these sorts of things, but personally can take a lot of credit for, for bringing that together on behalf of the, the teams. So I just want to acknowledge that. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, We have a question online from Councillor Ash. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I've had a couple of um, questions come to me from some Mangawika locals in regards to the western side of the of the bridge, uh, with the width of the bridge and, and acknowledging that it can take um, significantly heavier vehicles than previously. Has the um the road on that western side um is, has there been work that's been required to ensure that it's going to be suitable for these larger larger vehicles coming across the the bridge um and if there is work that's required to be done to strengthen that does that come under the shared cost of the bridge or is this something that we would be looking at further down the line as picking up as rdc um, solely as RDC, um, or is this not even a not even a, a an issue that needs to be considered? Thank it's you. It's actually not an issue at all. The uh, bridge was designed to take the heaviest loads um, that are travelling New Zealand, and the geometry of the approaches has been designed to take truck and trailers of all dimensions. So it has been designed to current standards and is fit for purpose. And it's worth noting that any in future years, um, any maintenance on either the western or the eastern side of the bridge would, would fall to the to the to the council where it falls. So, yes. so equally as, as any maintenance on the west hand side would be an RDC road maintenance issue, any any maintenance on the eastern side would be an MDC cost. So thank you for the clarity around that. That was certainly one of Councillor Ash's uh, yeah. Ash's question. Thank you, Hamish. Your Worship, no problem at all with the with the bridge, but the the roads either side of it aren't HP and beef roads, are they? Yes, they are. Are they? HP and B only relates to the structure itself. Yeah, I'm not, the, not, the, I'm the not the talking about the bridge. I'm talking about the approach the, roads. The geometry is no, I'm not talking about the even the approach roads to the bridge. 
I'm talking about the wider network. So once network. they cross the bridge, they are then moving onto roads that the heaviest vehicles in New Zealand can't use. That's right. So that's a legacy issue. Yeah. So that section there is really good and the rest not so good. Yeah, I just don't want the message going out online yeah. that we're saying that the heaviest truck and trailer units in New Zealand can use that road, big bridge, because yeah. they can't. But what, by that I meant it, it's yeah. um, HBMV. Yeah. HBMVs can use the entire network. Um, something carrying a transformer, it could go over the bridge, but it might struggle after that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> Uh, coming back to the uh, the report, uh, further items with regards to that, we were looking, we'd had the item from uh, Councillor Dalgetty with regards to the health and safety report, and that was on page 27, a couple of questions there around Mangawika Bridge. Further <coughs> items uh, through this report. Councillors have any notes or anything, Councillor Carter? Um, there's no, I was unable to find any notification regarding the um, rise of main to the Bulls Reservoir or the pump station part of it. There's, there's no costings in here, is it? Been dealt with or was it hidden in there somewhere? Three years, Chair. Uh, as far as I can see, the Pauka pump station is in there. Uh, the rising main to Bulls is done as part of the current contract that's running. So it's, it's, it's included in the Martin to Bulls centralization. Page 29. Yeah. So it's, it's all in there. Uh, I might just also, while I've got the opportunity to speak, just mention that the, the purple color on the utilities budgets or the utilities projects is projects that have been carried over that uh, Councillor Belgium requested last time. It's just an easy way to identify them. So to answer your question, the, the information is actually in the report. Thank you. So, clarified for you, Councillor Carter. Thank you. Further questions of the report, and thank you for the, um, the comment around the, the purple. Councillor Duncan. Thank you. Um, I have a question around where I would find the information or how the information might come to me um, regarding what um, measures we're taking to um, uh, regarding the um, water, the too much water problem we have in Tai Happy. So when we get the water, uh, the um, water events, and the water's coming into our articulation, and it's we're not able to cope with it because it either comes in too fast and there's too much. I just and there was a comment. So we retreated treated water. Yeah, the yes. treated water. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so we had to save water because we had action. We had too much water that was not able to be processed, um, is my understanding. And there was a comment that we were looking at valves to um, address the situation. I just wonder whether whether that would come into this sort of report, or where I would find that information. Yeah. I know. Yeah, I can re reply to that. Uh, those are day-to-day -day operational things um, that come and go. Right. I, I don't think um, I don't think it's possible to really report on those things on a, on a, on a structured in a structured way like this. Uh, just also just on the topic, it's two different things. Uh, there is valves being installed on the inlet line to reduce the inflow to comply with the consents. Mm -hmm. uh, the secondary uh, portion of the discussion is the rainfall interferes with the raw water quality makes it difficult to treat and Hamish's team has had a real tough time over the last six weeks or so to try and, and achieve um, uh, the kind of levels that we need what we do also request is for the type of community to just take mm. note of how they use water at the moment to be sure that they can serve as much as they can to allow the team to catch up and that will allow us then to make operational changes to the plant to improve the situation but we can only do that once the residents fall in. and I guess across the board it just highlights it's the raw water source uh, yeah, because we see it on, on many different things. It's where our rural water source comes in our ability to treat that rural water source, and when that is changing, uh, it puts pressure on, on, on multiple different parts of our infrastructure. Councillor Gordon. Um, supplementary to Councillor Duncan's question Is the um, restrict water notice or the you know, restriction of use, has that come up because our plant? 
is becoming less able to cope with the raw water quality or that the standards of treated water have lifted or some other problem. Because, you know, I'll note that raw water has been taken out of the Hautapu River for over 100 years. We, we seem to be getting a lot more um, conserved water notices now, and yet our environment hasn't changed that much. In fact, we're probably getting less rainfall events than more. That's a good, good, good question. Um, Hamish, Anna, do you guys want to tag team that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll kick off on that one. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, Angus, it's, it's, the, it's the former. Um, it's the treatment plant itself and its ability to treat the incoming raw water at a rate fast enough to replenish the reservoir and provide for the demands of the total <coughs> energy. Um, the drinking water standards, um, there are changes coming, but that's that's not in place yet. So as, as we mentioned, the, the operational team have had a really tough six, eight, 10, 12 weeks um, getting the Tai Api treatment plant uh, functioning properly. Um, part of it too is they just haven't been able to get the water reservoir to a level where they can implement some of the other changes they need to make because the use is, they're basically just keeping up with the, the demand. And so we've had events where we've been tankering water in uh, from, from Mangaweka and, and further afield just to, to keep the, the reservoir at an acceptable level. Because the last thing you want is a 20, 30, 40% in your reservoir and then you have a major failing and it's been drawn down even quicker. So, so it's an ongoing issue. I've got further meetings today and tomorrow to continue working with the operational team on that. But it is a, it is a headache for us. So the conserve water notice that's been put out um, is actually to ask the community to to basically give us a hand, um, reduce their consumption, to give us a chance to get the reservoir to a level where it's um, workable for us to maybe bring in some of these changes we're looking to make operationally in the plant. So it's, it is a headache at the moment that we're battling with. So we've we've got very little redundancy in that system. Well, the redundancy and it's kind of just luck that we haven't been here previously. Uh, good luck, good management. Um, but the current the current NTUs coming in and the level of treatment and the quality of the water coming out, it's, 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 it's taking a lot longer to produce the water. Um, one thing is worth, it's worth stressing is that the quality of the water that's being produced is still 100% compliant with the drinking water standards, so we're not producing substandard or lower quality water, it's just the plant's ability to produce it fast enough. That's, that's the problem, and that's a headache. So. Is there... Um, uh, and I know I know that um, from from our comms team we've got some some information about that. Does that need to be perhaps re looked at and refreshed uh, if, if there's the the urgency that you're speaking of? Hamish, is our is our <coughs> comms out around this strong enough, or do we need to refresh that um, better? Reply for me, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, we did last week refresh yes. the messages going out uh, to make it more uh, urgent. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, I've also talked to, to Arno um, that we may need to go more drastic uh, if we're not getting, so as Hamish said, in order to repair the plant properly, we need to have good reserves in our reservoir. Uh, and the notices so far have failed to uh, achieve that. So um, I've asked Arno to look at what the next steps might be, which is might be a little more um, challenging, which um, I don't know what they might be, but if I, we can't be in a situation uh, indefinitely. No, 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 I think that's that's good. But just if you <coughs> if you do um, in, in conversations with Hamish and, and, and our shared services partners and yourself and Arno, mm. if if you feel that you are stepping into that space, could I just uh, suggest that our northern um, councillors are, are advised of that as quickly as possible uh, to give them a heads up that where, what your next steps may be. I think it would be important to engage with them so they can uh, be forewarned to, uh, for the community, just as would be, would be good if we could just make sure that we're locked in as, a, as, as to take place. Your Worship. Uh, two questions from me. The first one relates to the, the Hautapu. Um, as you proceed north out of Tai Happy, not far from, I believe, where our intake is, there's been a fair amount of bulldozer work done along the edges of the river, um, fence lining and so on. Um, 
would that be a contributing cause? I can, can literally to the yeah. soil coming into that. I can reply to that, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I, may, uh, I took a drive out the Tuesday, had a look at it all the way upstream from the inlet to State Highway, and there's no earthworks upstream of the. Okay, so the, the obviously the inlet clear, clear too. So yeah, so it's clear then. Uh, yeah, so it's. Uh, I want to thank His Worship uh, for the heads up, but. It, it's clear and okay. it seems good. Yeah, thanks. And, and if I could too, I mean, whether it's whether there is earthworks or it's just a heavy rain event, the turbidity of the water is the key thing. And so the treatment plant should be able to deal with higher levels of turbidity. Okay. Typically what we would do when running a water treatment plant, um, having a full reservoir, um, which is what you always try to achieve, or very nearly full, when you do get a heavy rainfall event or some sort of disturbance upstream in the and the quality of that raw water is really low, so high turbidity. You would literally shut the plant down, let it flush through, and then start production again. But you can't do that if your reservoir is only 20, 30, 40% full. So that's part of the, the challenge we're trying to balance. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying um, um, matters around that. Uh, obviously, it's a concern to yeah. uh, to council, but also obviously to our um, to our uh, northern northern uh, district. Um, Right pass. Yeah. Councillor Delgetti? I'm just interested around the, the demand. Um, has that increased considerably? You, you, we're not keeping up with demand, so has that demand increased considerably and why would that be? No, the, the, mm. Three, the, the demand hasn't hasn't increased as such, it's just the demand hasn't reduced, just so despite the, the requests to conserve water and reduce demand, there's still the same amount of water that's, that's going out the Yep. Mm -hmm. and it's just our ability to produce clean compliant water and replace the reservoir and we're basically just holding our own. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you Hamish. Your Worship, your question. The, the second question, um, bottom of page 29, uh, thank you very much for the purple colouring um, that really simplifies the job but that raises an issue for me. If you take the last line of 29, the centralisation Martin Bulls project uh, we spent 1.2 out of $3.9 million required for that pipeline to go in the ground. But then the comment is pipeline is in construction due to complete before the 30th of June. So presumably if it's completed before the 30th of June, it's no longer a carryover. I'm looking, driving past, I can't see any way it's going to be completed. I can reply. Uh, yeah. Thank that. you, Anna. Uh, yeah, so actually uh, it's... It's really the other way around. The, the available budget's 1.2 million, and so far we spent uh, 3.8. Actually, that should be updated to where we are now, which is closer to 5 million. Um, it's just when we wrote the report, that was the number. Uh, and what we've done uh, with the blessing of council is we combined the 4.3 million above with 1.2 to give us 6.5 to pay for their pipeline this year. The contractor is still required to finish the work by end of June, and the latest program update seems like it'll, they'll be about two weeks late. So middle of July, it'll all be done, what will be in the ground? So it still was a carry forward then? No, so that was a carry forward from the previous year. I see. So the purples are carry forwards from the previous year into this year. Um, yeah, so uh, for this one, uh, the, the work will be done. So the, so the purple isn't the isn't a colouring to indicate what will be a carry forward from this year to next year. No. It's the previous year to this year. That's correct. Okay, that um, now I understand. Councillor Belsham, you have a question? I had a question around that figure. Um, does that include the funding we've received from the Three Waters uh, initiative? Yeah, that's correct. So that's where that, uh, a chunk of that funding is coming from. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> Further questions of this report as we're discussing there, going through. Councillors have anything uh, noted? All right, so the next section, if we could move on, is uh, compliance. And looking at that, there's some... Um, well-known issues that we've we've got across the board so um and I, I don't think looking at this and we, we know what some of the constraints are and, and um, across the board is there anything in particular in there that you'd like to make comment on uh, with regards to the the areas of non-compliance 
outside the ones that we're looking for now with um, uh, the new resource consents that we're applying for? That's correct, yes. Yeah. So it is, it is the same customers, uh, and it is like we've described before. Uh, actions are, are happening as we speak to resolve all of them. It will just take a bit of time. Um, so new consents, valves on the inlets, etc. that we will uh, continue with. And I do believe there's comment in there about engagement with um, our Horizons regional council partners that they're aware of where our program's at yeah, to absolutely. rectify some of these matters. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Councillor Belsham. Yeah, in regards with those consents and, and complying with them, uh, page 34, uh, just before item five there, the drinking water standards for New Zealand are currently in place, mm. but from the 1st of July 2022, the new drinking water quality assurance rules kick in. Do we have any concerns with our plants at present to be able to meet those new standards as at the 1st of July 22? Are we going to fall short in any of those requirements? Is there a massive change between the current uh, water standards, drinking water standards, and the new rules coming in on the 1st of July? Uh, I, can, I can reply to that. So we have, um, well, MDC has got staff that have looked at all of this in a lot of detail, uh, and I think we are confident that we will comply with the new guidelines. It is slightly different, but not vastly different. Uh, I'm not sure where that might end up in three or four years' time, but for now, we are confident that we will comply. Very important. So look further, further to that, um, that question, and it's a good question to ask, Councillor Belsham. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the standards, is it around reporting, or is it is it more in the levels in these new standards, or is it just the way we're reporting those? Well, I think, yeah, maybe if you want to. Yeah, a lot of it is, thank you, a lot of it is reporting. Um, I mean, you've got you've got different terminology around source water, um, and so things like um, a, a raw water source being sort of your highest at risk, so compound dams and, and open rivers, right through to deep bores and what we're secure, uh, secure bores, if you like, so they've sort of got a one to four category rating for that. Each of those has its criteria around what barrier protections and, and, and the like need to be in place, and then key to that is the reporting around that. So the, I guess the principle is the higher the risk of the source water, the more barrier protection is required and the more reporting around that, <coughs> which, is, which is largely the same as the current drinking water standards. It's just sort of reshaping it in a, in a more standardised format. So, so a lot of it is the technical reporting side of it. I think that ties directly into Council Belsham's question with regards to the ability of our plants. Is that where we're going? Follow up. From that, our, our information we provide, we don't have to implement any new equipment to provide the information they require. No, no, it's, it's, no, it's true. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for those um, answers, Hamish. Much appreciated. Mm -hmm. Moving through there, um, any other Items from the chairs. I mean, if you look at it, as it is, um, it is, it is, it is, there's a lot of red. So mm -hmm. it, it, on the face of it, it does look um, look pretty alarming. Um, but I'm I'm confident that our, our team do have the steps in place to try and manage this for to see some improvement. Mm -hmm. Maybe <coughs> see a bit more uh, a bit more, more green. But it's 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 a it's an, a it's a challenging environment to be in. Our aged plants and our, our and old resource consents are all attributing to to some of the um, the areas that we're seeing. If I could just make make one comment too, from a shared service perspective, um, if you look at a similar report for the Manawatu district um, wastewater treatment plants, you'll see a similar sort of profile for some of the smaller plants. A lot of them are working on old consent conditions, um, and so as the environmental conditions and requirements have got um, more, more stringent. Um, by default, you go from compliant to non-compliant. So the solution that MDC is putting in place is, is around the centralisation of the wastewater um, treatment plants to, to fielding, um, which is very much the same sort of cons consideration in terms of the, the Martin to Bulls centralisation, having one treatment plant, one consent, and then one set of um, conditions to, to address. So it does look, like you say, it doesn't look great. The MDC report looks similar for the smaller plants, but I guess as, as you move towards your centralisation of your larger plants particularly, and the reconsenting strategy that, that Anna and team have put in place, that there's a lot of administrative um, changes in that consenting process that will change that. Yeah. 
Um, certainly, the, um, on the, 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 the face of that, of, of say, centralising, um, makes perfect sense, but it comes with a big price tag. It certainly does. Uh, it comes yeah. with a big price tag, and, and then it comes with its own challenges, which we've heard about the um, restrictions we have with uh, you know, ability to, um, to find people to physically do the work and, and, and increasing costs we see. So the whole thing is a raft of challenges to try and um, to manage, manage these things to get them in, hopefully in a space of green. So we, yeah. we, ex we accept that. Yeah. Councillor Belsham. Uh, along those lines, then, you, you look at Hunterville uh, wastewater treatment plant, for example, and it's significantly red in the non-compliance. Mm -hmm. Has long-term thinking been um, thought about in regards with perhaps linking that up with the Bulls Martin treatment plant, where we're piping down uh, down a state highway network, perhaps into that that network, because this has been becoming more and more prevalent as non-compliant. Yeah, that's um, if I could probably start before Anna jumps in. Um, when, when the team, and this goes back many years, put together the initial proposal for the combined uh, system of Martin and Bulls and potentially looking at, at the networks and Bulls and potentially the um, RQ Air Force Base as part of that consideration, we did look at the feasibility of bringing in um, other treatment plants as well. But just the, the distance um, and the geography didn't lend itself to that. And that's not to say that a, a future consideration or or government direction or, or external funding might not change that, that equation, but it was a very deliberate decision to focus on Bulls and Martin, given that's where <laughs> the, the, the largest volumes of wastewater produced and the economics stacked up. To try and bring in the others at the time was was not not an option, but I don't know, have a comment on that going forward, but... Uh, uh, yeah, I think if, if I may, uh, Mr Chairman, uh, the only thing I want to add is our long-term view of Three Waters assets at the moment is only two years, which really... Uh, interferes with what is the what is the ultimate 30 or 50 year view of what we want to do and what's the cost involved because we don't know what's going to happen in two years time. I think I've heard the comment before engineers can do anything and yes. provide you give them enough money. Yes. And that's exactly right. <laughs> that is true. That is true. So that's one of those things. Um, your worship. I mean this is the government's argument, isn't it? On three waters. Rural councils with multiple towns are the poster boys for non-compliance and if cross subsidization was to flow through which is not a guarantee i'd have to accept that's government's argument that you, that we would be the net beneficiaries in terms of small rural councils multiple towns um you know that's exactly the argument they put to us of course, uh, Your Worship, and we're only working in two years when it remains to be seen as to whether that uh, unfolds. Um, yeah, absolutely. These, these good sense, and, and it'll be interesting to see what reporting we may see back in the future to this council table. Hopefully, yeah. we'll see some reporting yeah. back. But that's, that's the argument that government put forward, and we certainly don't like the way it's been done and all of those sorts of things. That's their position. Hamish, further? Just, just one, one final comment. I don't want to play with the point. I mean, Hunterville specifically being, being mentioned, I mean, that that consent in there, and if you look at the, the consent framework around it and you look at the actual effects of the wastewater treatment plant in terms of the polio restream, um, it's it's almost an administrative matter. It's not a matter of, of money and funding to try and fix it. It's actually having an appropriate consent wrapped around what's already happening because it's actually a really good plant. It's, it's just a, it's just some consent conditions and interpretations, and, and I'll be honest, and probably some errors that were that were factored into the consenting process. It doesn't need to be piped to Martin to fix it. It doesn't need fifty million dollars spent on it to fix it. It just needs an administrative process around the consent to to sort of validate what's already happening, and, and that's probably part of the, the picture that I think a lot of the the DIA thinking misses in the three water reform. That, throwing tens of millions of dollars at everything isn't what's required. But that's a community discussion at this stage and it involves local stakeholders, local EWI and obviously the regional council with the freshwater management. So. Good. Good I've Thank always you. been told that we actually, because that plant is there, we improve the stream. Mm. That's exactly how it is. Mm. 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 Because the amount of water we feed in back into it. Councillor Dalgetty, fine. Um, Question. While we're labouring Huntable, um, uh, just just interested in the state of play with the bore for around the drinking water. 
at that's sitting there and the importance, <coughs> in my view, of um, what is going to happen to Hunterville Rural Water uh, with the three waters going ahead and the need for the township to be find its own water source. Multiple questions in there. Um, probably on the, on the board itself. I think the future of the scheme and separation of urban and rural, that, that's very much part of the three waters reform process that Mayor Andy may have a line in on that, but that, that's a, probably a, an hour in itself, potentially. Yeah, through you, yes, Mr Chair. Uh, there are a hundred odd council-owned rural water schemes throughout New Zealand. There's about 75,000 privately owned schemes, but the, all of the council owned schemes will pass to the new entity at this, and then there is a process where the council, council owned schemes, rural water that are straight stock water or water taken out of canals, etc. There'll be a reasonably speedy process as we understand it. It's yet to be put into law because these are only recommendations from the working group, will be able to exit um, the water entities. They'll still be responsible if potable water at households to comply with standards. However, the difficulty will be the hunt for us, the huntable one, because we would need to separate out absolutely. Otherwise, the entity would no way that they would let it be privatised in effect. Um, and even then, there'd be a whole series of challenges because of its scale and the number of houses that would be drawing from it that will be in the hard basket because of the mix of, of stock and urban supply. A lot more to come. Huge yeah. amount more to come. And, yeah. and, and that's based on, you know, again, more questions and answers, as is often the case in, in, in some of these um, bits and pieces. Um, moving on from that question and further into the report, are there any other questions in there? Sorry, Councillor Carter. Um, trying to get my head around the solid waste um, graph. Um, November, December, tonnage going to the landfill. Is that to do with the likes of Putarino? Being dumped in there at that time or not? No, through you, Mr. Chairman. No, that came later. Um, let's say from February onwards. Uh, the patterns, I think, really were driven more by lockdowns and other mm -hmm. things that were artificial in the previous year that we didn't see before. Uh, you can see that the pattern has stabilised now and it's back to normal levels. Um, so we're not quite sure what's driven there, but it would have been. Two very strange years for solid waste collection. Yeah. And further question, Councillor Carter. The next graph with the um, recycling. Mm. Is it a concern that our recycling is dropping off? Yeah. Three years, Jim, it is a concern, but it's a, it's an international concern. Uh, recycling and the recycling markets become quite challenging. I think Hamish would have a lot more information on that, um, but not as easy as it was even three years ago. Yeah. Um, if, if, I, if I could, yeah, and if you look at the direct comparison between the higher <coughs> volumes going to landfill and those lower um, diversion rates, that there was a period of, of largely COVID sort of lockdown and, and, and disruption there where material that had previously been recycled was being landfilled because that was the only place that it could go in terms of the operation of the sites. And there's probably a, a lag across a number of um, months in there. Um, but Anna's quite right, the, the market for recyclables um, the probably going back about four or five years with the sort of the the Chinese market and some of the foreign markets not accepting those recycled products that 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 reduced the availability of options for products to go to so there's probably been a, a bit of a hiatus there some councils have, have sort of dropped down what they're actually collecting so only taking plastics one two and fives as opposed to the full one through seven and so that affects on your on your um, diversion rates. There's a lot of drive, as you know now, from central government through the MFE in terms of that recycling uh, push and what we can do. Some of the market has come back a little bit, 
but it is fairly it, it's fairly lumpy in terms of the the actual commodity value of your paper and your cardboard, so your fibre components and your glass, your tin, your aluminiums, and your and your um, plastic grades and that. So there's a range of opportunities that are that are being worked on. Some some regionally, and I know we're working on a few in, in fielding, but I know around the, the country there, there's a bit of lumpiness with how much is collected, where it goes, and, and what it's actually worth. Yeah. Here we are trying to promote um, recycling and the fact of us doing it curbside. Um, is it viable, looking at the graphs as such? Observation I would make is, yes. part of it is the financial side, is, is it viable? Mm. The other part of it is, as a corporate leader or community steward, um, do we want to focus on landfill diversion and actually getting into a circular economy and, and pro 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 providing and promoting recycling, recognising that that may actually come at a slightly higher cost or it may be a higher cost in the interim until such time as the, the downstream place for these recycling products is, is properly established and re established. Um, but if you're always looking for the cheapest option, um, I'm sure you'll find somebody with a hole in the ground who can fill it up um, with that. So recycling doesn't always mean cheapest. That's, that's, that's without a consent. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you were, you, you were, yeah, you a, a, a really really interesting discussion Tuesday is in, um, with a whole lot of other mayors and so on around discussions around um, you know, climate change, etc. And one of the parts of that discussion was we may well be mandated that we are responsible for curbside recycling. That's correct. Um, there's a whole lot of targets in there, including. Um, you know, for instance, Palmerston North City was saying um, the figures that they've been given almost indicate to them that, that they may have to put in place carless days and stuff like that. Um, there's an enormous number of stuff coming at us in terms of getting down to target levels. There's be nothing that we can we can solve or fix it uh, in, in, in this this meeting here today. Absolutely uh, but we, we have no doubt that some reports will be forthcoming in the future with some direction that we'll need to consider as to what we yeah. can and cannot do. And we need to be in the position to be able to argue from fact around a whole lot of this yeah. stuff. That's not going to be pretty. Sorry, one for the comment there. If, if there's any interest, um, the NDC's gone through a review of the waste management minimisation plan, picking up the government's direction, probably slightly probably slightly ahead of, but very much in the same alignment there. We've gone through a consultation process. We had our deliberations last week, and next week we're looking at formally adopting that um, waste minimisation plan, which sets out a whole range of enhancements to our curbside um, offering and, and the way that we run our sort of wider resource recovery initiatives. So if there's any interest um, in that, it'll be adopted formally by the council next week, and it will sort of chart our course for the next two to six years, including putting level of service changes and funding into the next LTP. So All right. Quick couple of questions before we can we move on on this item. We're, we're starting to push for time. Uh, Councillor Ash has her hand up online. Thank you. Um, through you, Chair. Um, wondering, because this obviously goes way further than just recycling, um, I'm wondering how much thought has gone into the Manawa 2 um, policies in regards to um, recycling other products. Uh, I know a number of councils around the country, uh, Raglan's a great example of, you know, all the building um, the surplus, you know, uh, stuff from the building industry is uh, is recycled. Every, everything seems to be recycled there. So does the document go further than just um, the curbside recycling? Does it go into um, all other products that can be possibly recycled? It, it sort of blows me away whenever I do go to the um, transfer stations and see a number of things there that are chucked out, like, like doors and stuff that could be used. Um, yeah, just wondering where we are in that space. Thank you. Can you answer that um, question? There's a lot of questions in there. No, I mean, it's, it's slightly off, off topic for the RDC solid waste, but um, the waste minimisation plan, which RDC will also have as part of its process, um, MDC focused on the curbside offering and sort of talked about the other um, resource recovery initiatives that are potentially in play as well. Um, so not part of the consultation, but we do, we do have a, um, a private 
partnership in place with Central Environmental, which is a, uh, a subsidiary company of Central Demolition, one of the larger demolition companies in the country. And they've got a large site down at our wastewater plant on Turners Road to, to, to recover things like concrete and steel, but they're also expanding that to recover uh, building materials um, and all of the fixtures and fittings when they deconstruct um, a, a house or a commercial property. So it really depends on what you're consulting with the community on in terms of council services, but then separately in that situation is what we're doing, I guess, working with private industry to support those landfill diversion and resource recovery initiatives. So it's probably a, a larger discussion offline from this particular meeting, which I'm happy to happy to have, but there's a lot going on in that space, Councillor Ash. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, are there any other questions regarding to this item? Being none, could I have somebody move that we receive uh, the report? Thank you, Councillor Carter. Thank you, second to Councillor Belcher. Now, the next item that we have on our um, on our agenda here is the uh, technical audit report from Wakako Tahi. Uh, just noting that a lot of our earlier conversations are probably built into some of what's here in the here in this reporting. And again, mindful of time because we do have a big schedule on today uh, with policy uh, and planning following this meeting, and to enable our our uh, meeting for this afternoon. Is there anything in particular within this uh, audited report that we've seen from Wakata Katahi? It is quite detailed. Um, Councillor Rokawa. Just a question, Mr Chair, um, on number R3.4. What is RSLCMP? <laughs> what, is, what does that acronym mean? Please. Sorry, what page are you referring to? Page 14. Page 14, sorry. R3.4. Just wanted to know what that means. Okay, well, we'll see if we can get. I'll have to Google it. It's not. Oh, okay. <laughs> Alan, Alan's uh, stepped up to the plate on this one. Yeah. It's. Uh... Oh, it's the bridge. It's the road. It's the bridge maintenance. Life cycle report. Yeah. Um, so we have a report every three years. We we get WSP to do a um, road structure life cycle management plan <laughs> um, and they go through all the bridge data that we've got and they produce from that we, we produce the, the forward works program um, and it says implements the six key actions from that what we do we put it in the forward works program and that's how we develop it there's a lot of stuff in here um, I like the first one, the R2.1, that was purely based on the drive round, there was a slip and it was in the water table. So R2.1 was all about the one slip that he saw that hadn't been cleared, about, <laughs> which was about two or three wheel barrels full. <laughs> Councillor Gordon, question? Um, comment if I may. R2.1, I noted that with interest, and I also noted the photographs in that report with interest, because I actually recognised a lot of those sites, because they're sites that I've had with ratepayers in my ear for the last X number of years, mm -hmm. and they're generally on gravel roads um, well beyond, well from here. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, uh, and, you know, a lot of those sites actually become problem sites where the water table's full, the water spills off the edge, the, the road fills away, and then we spend an awful lot of money putting in retaining walls and building up what used to be a road again. Yeah, so, that's not, that's a sweeping generalisation. It's not that bad. Um, it does happen. But, um, yeah, that's what that's about, clearing the drains. Again, uh, John, it comes back to the earlier comments from, from yes. earlier in the meeting. Yes. Our, our ability to, to, to react to some of these things, to, yeah. as you, your words, uh, be more resilient yeah. to <coughs> events, to save us some money. And, and that's what they're on about. But it's, yeah, it's easy to say. <laughs> uh, but when you've got a network that's 1,300 yeah. kilometres long, it's a bit hard to get around it with four guys. Um, the, the, yeah, to be fair though, John, you know, the, the, the travel spots aren't that long. 
Yeah. So that's what that's about. So that's some, an action for improvement. Um, improve the asset management plan. Now, there's, there's a, a number of these which have come out of the government's um, road to zero um, push on safety. So you've got R3.2. Um, 5.1, R5.1, um, 5.2, and 5.3 are all new things that they've come, they're focusing on, and it's all to do with safety. So it's stuff that uh, we have to do, this to come out of um, Wellington. The R4.1, we do sealed payment condition ratings every two years. They want us to do it every year, so, okay. Um, yeah, so there's a whole we would wrapping be, up of things that we have to do. This, so with, the, with regards to that, again, we're just mindful of time here. Um, so there's a number of recommendations in there. So at what stage would we, when can we expect to see, or how do we know that the recommendations that have been suggested through this order report are being implemented? Where do we see that being fed back yes. to us that All we this know that it's been done? Into the, every three years we do the voting activity management plan. Yep. So we have to take all these things into consideration. And then when we do the program business case to do the next three years program, we have to give effect to all these. So all these flow into the process for developing the next. But it will seem to me that some of these things that have been suggested that you uh, yeah, there's could, some things could be like clean the actually drains. a lot, yeah. a lot We wouldn't want to be waiting yeah, three, the process, three years. The process stuff goes. A lot of this is process. Like developing, um, uh, where is it? A safety deficient database. And then that was a huge task. Yeah, we, we, we can see so that. It's more sort of that. But there's the wheel barrel for the muck in the drain. We can get onto that straight away. The rest of it, there's a lot of work to improve processes. Mm. And this is happening across the country. Because when I read this, I thought this didn't seem to have any reflection on the audit was, that was done. I had the Word document. So I looked at the author, and it all came out of Wellington. So it's all new stuff that Waka Kotahi is imposing on councils and clean the drains. Okay. I don't think we'll um, get any more further questions from today's meeting to um, to go into this report. We could be here for some time delving into it, the, the yeah. links that we could go into. Um, so if there is no further questions, particularly around this report, could I have somebody move that we receive the audit report for Waka Kotahi? Thank you, Councillor. Taken from Councillor Gordon. Are there no other late items? Can I? Yes. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I, we, you and I had discussed last week after um, Councillor Gordon um, highlighted the issue on Moko Road. Yes. Um, and I wanted this with our writing experts in the room to. Uh, have a, and I acknowledge we only have three minutes to have this conversation, but it, we could defer it to another meeting um, around the expectation management of of uh, unsealed roads and maintenance, um, and particularly around reactive and proactive maintenance. Um, if I, I I had intended to have um, my head of customer service in here as well, I hadn't talked to Carol unfortunately. Because we do get a lot of or, uh, requests for service to regrade the road, uh, and when we send our teams out there, a regrade of the road is not necessary. It's just what that's what the, um, the person is requesting, uh, and and so I, I would like to have that conversation because I do feel there's a mismatch, but also an opportunity for elected members to reset this, because if you wish for greater proactive maintenance, that is a setting that is within your request, but it will have a, an impact in terms of our rating position because we'll need to employ more people. 
but um, trying to understand where you wish us to go on this uh, is really important for me. And I've acknowledged I've taken one of the three minutes, uh, Mr. Chair. Yeah, it, it, it is a it is a, a, a bigger discussion. I think we should be having. Um, it's a greater understanding, and it, it's in my my chair's report to get a greater understanding of uh, for elected members in, in conjunction with Hamish and John and yourself, so we, we we can get a greater understanding of of what we can and what we can't do, and and also um, how we can if we maybe we can change the way we are doing it, as I said in my report, to put some resources and, and manpower and things into better spots if, we, if we're thinking about it a little bit more pragmatically and, and how we have that conversation. So I think we should be... Can I suggest, Mr Chair, we move this to a workshop? Yes, absolutely then, was yeah. what I was going to suggest, that that may be best <laughs> if we could do that. Uh, and it would, we would welcome Hamish and John and himself to have a, a broad <laughs> conversation. <laughs> Just to let you know what's coming up. Because we're coming to the end of this last three year period of the Higgins contract, what we have to do between now and Christmas is to write the procurement strategy, which is where we get your valuable input as to what type of contract you'd like to see. There's various models, so we've got a, a consultant who's going to be putting that together, but we could have a series of workshops and I can explain various contracting models that you can have, and I want you to decide on the model, then from after Christmas, then we have to write that contract, and then you can put your levels of service in that contract, going forward, but still be aware of the one network voting classification and you can have anything you want as long as you pay for it. Mm -hmm. One pro tacky road for the road that's got 16 vehicles a day will finance it at that level. If you want it better maintenance, it's unsubsidized. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, John. I think that would be um, that would be a good approach and a practical approach for uh, the committee to take going forward to, to get that greater understanding um, to see that, and, and, and to understand what our our wishes are, and also that of our um, of our communities as well. So I think that's very important. Um, if there are no further questions, I will call the meeting to a close. Um, thank you to Hamish, uh, John, Phil, and Alan over there. Thank you for uh, for joining us. Um, thank you for clarifying some of the questions that, as a committee, we had. We appreciate seeing you here. Thank, thank you for the invitation. Appreciate your time. time. So, thank you very much. If there are no further matters, mm -hmm. I'll call the meeting closed. Uh, to a close at 10:51 uh, a.m. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your attendance and thank you for your input and questions. Thank you.